Good morning, folks. I'm Joe Long, the education curator of the South Carolina Confederate Relic Room and Military Museum. And that's not where I am. This is a fake background behind me. But uh, despite the fake background, we're going to do some real history today. And I think some, some really interesting history. Uh, you see, I busted out my Spanish-American War blouse for this lesson today. I also have some, um, some authentic Dr. Pepper here with me today. By the time of the Spanish-American War, you could drink Coca-Cola or Dr. Pepper, invented by and named for Dr. Claude Pepper, a Confederate surgeon from Texas. And I also pulled a book off my shelf. Uh, one of my prized possessions is an encyclopedia set from my grandmother. Uh, and all of her kids grew up using this encyclopedia set for research reports. And one day when I was fourth or fifth grade, I was doing a research report too, and I was at grandma's house, so I looked up airplanes in her encyclopedia. And to my surprise, the encyclopedia told me that heavier than air aircraft were impractical. And so for the first time, I checked the date in grandma's encyclopedia. And it turned out that her Encyclopedia Britannica set was 1898. And so, that gave me a great chance for today's topic to look up and see what we know at the beginning of the Spanish-American War about the disease called yellow fever. Now, you'll excuse me for reading uh, the period language straight out of the encyclopedia as I, I look up to see, uh, say that I'm a soldier headed perhaps for Cuba or Puerto Rico or the Philippines during that war. And I'd like to know about this yellow fever stuff. Well, what I learned by looking in my encyclopedia is yellow fever is a typhus-like fever of certain ports or of ships hailing from them. It differs from all other existing types of fevers and infections in largely sparing the Negro. It resembles cholera in being endemic in some parts of the world, but only shipping places, and in being importable to others in being an infection that issues from the soil or some medium equivalent thereof, and in being a virulent filth disease. But it differs from cholera in having at the outset a violent febrile paroxysm lasting two or three days as a fever resembles typhus. An attack of yellow fever may follow definite exposure, such as landing at an endemic port within a few hours. But the outbreak is often delayed for a few days, the limit of incubation being about eight. The few hours languor, chilliness, headache, and muscular pains, which might be the precursors of any febrile attack, are followed by a peculiar look of the eyes and face, which is characteristic. The face is flushed, the eyes suffused at first, and then congested or ferity, the nostrils and lips red and the tongue scarlet, these being the most signs, obvious signs of the universal congestion of the skin, mucous membranes, and organs. The temperature has risen, the pulse is quick, strong and full, but may not keep up, all the usual accompaniments of a high fever, hot skin, failure of appetite, thirst, nausea, restlessness, and delirium. Um, and it goes on to describe the many and unpleasant symptoms of this terrifying disease of yellow fever, which remember, the encyclopedia just told me two things about it, that Africans can't get it, and that it is a filth disease. That's enough to set the story here. 
and begin our narrative today of South Carolina's very unusual military heroes uh, of the occupation right after the Spanish-American War in 1898. If you visit our state house, which uh, soon I hope that you can do again, and enjoy the, the outdoor park-like atmosphere around the building itself, you'll see a number of, of really interesting monuments. One of those monuments, you see it on the right there, is the South Carolina Spanish-American War Monument. And you see the soldier there with his rifle and his cartridge belt, his 1898-style campaign hat, uh, the crest of the Spanish-American War volunteers. And if you examine that monument closely and read each side of it, you will learn about some very interesting smaller stories that had to do with that war. Now, the painting on the left, you see a number of doctors in uniform, and this commemorative painting is titled The Conquest of Yellow Fever. And so the terrible disease that I have just told you all about, um, we're going to learn more about how the disease suffered a defeat at the hands of the American military. And we'll learn about some uh, junior soldiers who had a hand in that defeat. Now, throwing back to a slide from a couple of weeks ago, uh, the scene setting here, most of the men in this photograph, perhaps all of them, would have had fathers who fought in the Confederate Army in the 1860s. But each of them is a South Carolinian. Each of them is wearing the blue battle shirt, and khaki trousers, the gaiters and campaign hat of the United States Army in its tropical campaigns. And these men are headed off to Cuba to fight the Spanish in 1898. It's an interesting war. Some folks called it the splendid little war, and some folks didn't come home from, from it. But the recruiting of Southern soldiers, uh, we went over when we did a Span Am class a couple of weeks ago, and it was known that most service was going to happen in tropical regions. Uh, if you look here, you'll see for Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines, wanted for the United States Army. And these men are being recruited through the normal and uh, the, the standard army recruiting procedure. But others are going to be recruited for the Spanish-American War under a slightly different paradigm. Remember what the Encyclopedia Britannica of 1898 told us right away about yellow fever. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica told us that it did not affect uh, people of African descent, that they were not liable to getting this terrible disease. And that belief inspired the recruiting of what were called, uh, oh, hold on. Uh, well, I'll just get, go ahead to what I was actually talking about. That inspired the recruiting of what were called the immune regiments. 10 regiments of men were going to be recruited for the United States Army specifically to be immune to the tropical diseases that military planners knew were going to be the biggest danger to American uh, personnel going into the tropical areas that could be uh, stricken with yellow fever. So 10 regiments of men are actually going to be raised specifically from among people who are considered immune to the disease. And you are considered immune to uh, yellow fever if you had had it previously. 
or simply if you were of African extraction, uh, they were considered to be immune soldiers. And so regiments were raised and sent specifically on the basis of being immune. Um, hopping back a little bit, the man who goes to Cuba in the 1890s, this is a wool sack coat and they're still being issued. Uh, the wool battle shirt we saw a little bit earlier, so that even if you are not wearing the full uniform, your shirt here is wool, you've got cotton trousers, but it's not a particularly um, suitable to the climate kind of uniform. And they head down into the tropics uh, equipped as you see them here. Now the, the hat, the hat is wonderful. The campaign hats were actually made by the Stetson Company, uh, which might make them the single most American hat uh, ever designed and issued to the US military, unless you count the baseball cap that the Navy likes. Uh, but these Stetson hats were very practical for tropical duty. The rest of the uniform, not necessarily. And the soldiers in Cuba are going to face much more danger from tropical disease than from the Spanish. Indeed, over the six months of active fighting in Cuba, um, there are 369 combat deaths, combat casualties, counting both those men who were killed in battle and also those men who died of wounds suffered in battle. 369 combat deaths over, I'm sorry, five months, not six. During that time, there were 1,939 deaths from disease, mostly typhoid fever. And of those who contracted typhoid fever uh, and were treated for it in the army, about 7.7% of those who got typhoid fever died from it. Not as many men got yellow fever. However, of those who were hospitalized for yellow fever, from 30 to 60% would die, no matter what medical treatment they got. And so yellow fever was a particularly dangerous disease. Yellow fever historically was an old enemy of South Carolinians. Uh, it was called yellow fever because of a jaundiced look you would get around the face if you contracted this disease, but it had others names. It was also called the black vomit. Uh, acid uh, would turn the blood in your stomach black. And they said if you vomited out that blood in your stomach, um, it, it looked like coffee grounds. I found that a particularly horrifying and disgusting image, so I decided to share it with you all today. Uh, so the yellow fever or the black vomit were the same disease, and another name for the disease was stranger's fever. As the Encyclopedia Britannica just told you, it seemed to be people who were new to town, new arrivals off the boat, people visiting from elsewhere in a yellow fever region who would often contract the disease. Uh, it had struck South Carolina early and viciously. The 1699 yellow fever epidemic in Charleston killed about 15% of the population. And there would be epidemics of yellow fever in South Carolina at intervals all the way up to an 1878 uh, epidemic that happened in Beaufort. South Carolina. So these men going to Cuba, it's only 20 years after an epidemic of yellow fever had actually struck South Carolina. So they were well aware of how horrible uh, this disease was. And by the way, although we're going to tell a story about victory against yellow fever by the military, it wasn't the kind of victory you might expect. Still today in 2020, there is no cure or yellow fever. 
So back to our immune troops. Three companies of these men were recruited from South Carolina. Um, they were all members of the 10th Immune Regiment. Uh, and they would all be sent first to Florida, then to Cuba, and then return through the United States. And the story of their service uh, has to do with that belief that the biology of the African somehow protected him from yellow fever. Uh, this belief, by the way, was not true. What protected you, what gave you immunity to yellow fever was having had it before. And something they didn't realize about the disease at the time, uh, and we believe we have much better statistics about it today, is that about 80% of the people who ever contracted yellow fever uh, didn't have significant symptoms. Now, in some cases, they would have flu-like symptoms for three or four days. But they weren't the severe symptoms that people associated with yellow fever. They weren't black coffee ground vomit. Their faces didn't turn yellow. Uh, and so in general, uh, many people had had yellow fever without it ever being known they had had yellow fever. And so they were immune to it after contracting it once. That was the reality. That was why it was stranger's fever in the low country and other places in the world, because people who'd never had it were those who were vulnerable to contracting it. So now we've got our soldiers headed down. And if you look closely here, uh, the Spanish-American War troops have adopted the blanket roll system of carrying their stuff. That was a common Confederate method of carrying your blanket and field gear wrapped up inside the blanket 30 years earlier. It's become standard in the US Army by 1898. Well, we're not telling the story of the war today, of the valor of the men who defeated the enemy in combat. Um, that's a story that is well worth your time and efforts. But winning resulted in occupying some tropical areas, uh, particularly Cuba. And in Cuba, the main threat to our soldiers is going to be tropical disease, particularly typhoid and yellow fever. Major Walter Reed, you might have heard of Walter Reed Hospital in Bethesda, Maryland. Walter Reed Hospital is named after this US Army surgeon of the late 1800s and early 1900s. And the really important task force to attack yellow fever was the fourth United States Army Commission on Yellow Fever, which is a pretty boring name. And so everybody called it the Reed Commission. He was the driving force and the animating spirit of this commission. And of the many historical firsts, and successes of this commission. One in particular, um, you might be aware of controversy that has surrounded some 19th century doctors uh, who did experiments on patients, uh, not necessarily telling the patient about it. Uh, and you know, there are doctors who made great strides in advancing human knowledge uh, but did so without the patient's permission. Well, one thing about what we're about to study, it involved the first signed informed patient consent forms uh, that were done for experimental subjects as Walter Reed launched his offensive against yellow fever. Now, if you recall my handy dandy Encyclopedia Britannica here, copyright 1898, has told us that yellow fever, let me get the exact phrase again, an infection that issues from the soil or some medium equivalent thereof, and in being a virulent filth 
disease. That's a really interesting phrase. Uh, so the sum total of human knowledge, in many ways, in 1898, the Encyclopedia Britannica, um, is telling us that yellow fever is a, is a disease of bad hygiene or of some kind of particles that transmit the disease. It is a virulent filth disease. Uh, so that tells you that's the dominant theory of how infection happens in 1898. Now, South Carolinians had responded to the unhealthy nature of the low country at certain seasons of the year. Um, wealthier South Carolinians would move away from Charleston during the fever seasons uh, and get away from those coastal areas. The other thing the encyclopedia told us was that ports and shipping areas were where you would get yellow fever. The Encyclopedia Britannica also has a mystery in it in 1898. It says, well, Africans are immune to this disease. And yet the course of the disease spreading throughout the world followed the slave trade, uh, the encyclopedia claimed. As we study yellow fever, we'll find that it comes from one area to another. Slaves are imported to that area which they find strange because according to them, the Africans can't get the disease in the first place. Many, many mysteries facing this silent killer. And I'm sure that many of these um, 18th and 19th century sufferers turn to the 91st Psalm and uh, the verses about a noisome pestilence and uh, the death that stalks in the night. Um, they would learn but only in 1901, that yellow fever was actually more like the destruction that wasted by noonday. You almost always contracted it in daylight, although you didn't know that. Attempts to get away from the bad air of the swamps were one of the, one of the things that drove people inland during fever season. Uh, all in precautions, against this, this very deadly and extremely mysterious disease. Well, Walter Reed, our mastermind today, has some different theories about how this disease might possibly be being spread. And if he's gonna fight this thing, he's got to know for sure what causes it. By the way, I, I put a little citation here uh, the Army History Center has done a wonderful little piece on Walter Reed. And if you really want to dig, uh, the Claude Moore Health Sciences Library at the University of Virginia. I'm going to quote some lines from their online exhibit about the work of the Yellow Fever Commission. So what our major here is going to do is set up an experiment to try to determine how you contract yellow fever. And the dominant theory is that it is, quote, a filth disease. But the dissident theory is it has something to do with being bitten by mosquitoes. So Walter Reed sets up a controlled experiment environment to find out how it might be transmitted. And these are uh, the one theory, the filth disease theory, depends on something called fomites. Fomites are supposed to be the infected particles of dirt or filth or waste or whatever. Fomites are the infected garbage that supposedly spread the virulent filth disease. And Walter sets up two buildings, well, building one and building two of the experiment down in Cuba. Uh, now the war is over, but the forces are still being stricken with disease. So are the native Cubans. And the United States uh, is, is in a, an expansive and, and typically 
for our nation, a very benevolent mood that wants to go down there and do something about the diseases, not just that our forces are stricken with, but are endemic to the area. We threw out the Spanish, now we're gonna throw out yellow fever. So he sets up two buildings, uh, building number one, and I'm quoting that exhibit at uh, University of Virginia's library. Building number one is the infected clothing building. The building was a single room tightly constructed to contain as much foul air as possible. A small stove kept the temperature and humidity at tropical levels. So even if the heat slacked off for some reason in Cuba, um, the, the stove is gonna keep things up to uh, properly miserable levels. Now, building number two, because the fomite building is about filth causing the disease. Building number two has to be free of filth because building number two is going to test the mosquito infection theory. So it's got mosquito, a mesh screen in there for the mosquitoes. Um, unfortunately for the occupants, the mosquito netting there is meant to keep the mosquitoes inside, not to let those infected mosquitoes get away. Three South Carolina soldiers volunteer for the Yellow Fever Commission experiments. They are Sergeant Levi Folk of Newberry. Uh, James Hanbury is from Orangeburg, South Carolina. And Private Charles Sontag is from Columbia, South Carolina. And each of these soldiers is a volunteer, knowing full well at the time of volunteering that he is likely to contract the deadly yellow fever in the course of the experiment. Um, now, perhaps the exact details of how the experiment's gonna be carried out uh, maybe those are not made entirely clear to these men. Uh, I'm reading here from a description of what Levi Folk went through. Uh, he was first assigned to the Fomite building. Levi Folk was a former infantryman. Uh, he had been in the infantry, but at, when he re-enlisted, he re-enlisted in the hospital corps. And he would spend three weeks sleeping in the soiled bedding and living in the dirty clothing of former yellow fever patients, clothing which had not been cleaned in the tropics. So, um, I don't know how many of you have had the experience of, of wearing a dirty uniform, um, but this was wearing somebody else's dirty uniform, soaked with bodily fluids and excretions that came from the previous um, wearer of whatever it was that was issued to them. Uh, there was a doctor in the previous round of men in the Fomite house who reported that given this filthy clothing and sleeping in these filthy beds from patients, uh, many of whom had died of yellow fever, uh, a doctor, Robert Cook, said, we all felt like we were coming down with yellow fever every day. Our squad with one accord developed chills on our own, concluding that it, since it was so easy to produce a case of the disease in a perfectly sanitary camp, it was small chance for us to escape. So these men are living for three weeks in the complete filth and misery of um, uh, the used infected clothing and bedding of men who have died from yellow fever. Whether this was made clear to them when they joined up for the experiment 
Uh, now they were told at the outset, uh, you get a hundred dollars bonus for doing this yellow fever experiment. And if you actually contract yellow fever during the experiment, that'll be another hundred bucks. Uh, and maybe that was attractive at some level. I'm not sure how attractive it would have been if it had been described to them at the outset. By the way, the first thing you're gonna have to do is sleep in the nasty, filthy beds of people who died in there. And um, uh, you're gonna live in those conditions. Well, what did they learn at the Fomite House? At the Fomite House, they learned that these men sealed away from mosquitoes, living in misery and filth, did not contract yellow fever. In other words, Encyclopedia Britannica was wrong. It was not a virulent filth disease. It was something else. Typhoid, the other great killer of American soldiers uh, in the occupation after the Spanish-American War, typhoid was more of a filth disease. Poor camp sanitation, um, bacteria uh, traveling around uh, through poor sanitary methods in camp uh, spread typhoid, but not yellow fever. But Remember that some people were immune from yellow fever. So our three South Carolinians and the other army volunteers who had been in the Fomite house were now sent to the mosquito house. Because if they just did the experiment and showed that they didn't get it, maybe they didn't get it from so-called fomites because they all happened to be immune. But if they didn't get it from so-called fomites, but then they did get it in the mosquito house. That would mean that they had nailed what the transmission method was for yellow fever. Well, guess what? Success in the mosquito house, all three of these men would contract yellow fever at last. These aren't the guys. We don't have any pictures of those three particularly gallant men, or I ought to say, I don't have any pictures of those volunteers. Perhaps the pictures are out there somewhere. Um, but we see some typical South Carolinians on the boat on the way over to Cuba. Um, Here's some high-spirited young men posing in a fake fight with their bayonets uh, and doing the kind of horseplay around camp that young soldiers always do. And here we have one of the plaques on the South Carolina Spanish-American War monument. Only four names appear on our Spanish-American War monument at the State House grounds. One of them is a Navy captain, not from South Carolina, and his name is on the monument because a quote that he made is used and it's cited. But these three names, these three names here on our Spanish-American War monument are those of our yellow fever volunteers, men who entered an experiment knowing that they were likely to contract yellow fever and that yellow fever had a 30 to 60 percent death rate for those who were hospitalized for it. If you came and got a diagnosis of medical treatment with yellow fever, there was a 30 to 60 percent chance that you would die. This is still true of serious cases of yellow fever today. They were completely unaware at that time that most cases of yellow fever were minor, three or four days of flu-like symptoms or maybe no symptoms at all. They volunteered for something that had a pretty good chance of killing them. And in doing so, they allowed the army experiment to actually prove what the disease vector was. 
Now, our monument specifying their names also says that they were honored by the United States Congress with a special gold medal and a lifetime pension, although not much of one. But what they really did was make the sacrifice of a lot of their buddies a little bit more meaningful. Uh, many forgotten casualties of that war are buried in Cuba uh, or even in Florida, uh, where they contracted yellow fever, a mysterious disease blamed on filth that had nothing to do with camp sanitation conditions or whether you washed your uniform or anything like that but with the bite of an infected mosquito. And by proving that, they were able to make huge strides forward to controlling that terrible, deadly disease. Uh, and remember, this was a disease that had devastated South Carolina in its early colonial days, killing at 1.15% of the population of Charleston, and that had not gone away, uh, that had returned at intervals, that had had a epidemic that these soldiers maybe knew about just 20 years earlier in Beaufort, South Carolina. Dr. Lazier here is one of the four doctors on the commission, uh, on Walter Reed's commission to study yellow fever. And the camp they were at was called Camp Lazier. He was being memorialized because of the four doctors, he was the one who himself contracted and died of yellow fever in the course of proving how the disease was transmitted. And this would result in an army victory. Uh, by the way, our three brave South Carolinians cited on the South Carolina Monument, they all contracted yellow fever and they all survived. Uh, in fact, Levi Falk would remain in the Army and retire only after 23 years of service, um, serving all the way through World War I and having a very distinguished non-commissioned officer career. As far as I can tell, the others left the Army after the Spanish-American War and returned to their homes. But all three of South Carolina's volunteers survived. And this Hospital Corps Commission here, these are the guys being honored in this painting called The Conqueror of yellow fever. Now, how is Dr. Walter Reed considered, and his colleagues, of course, the conquerors of yellow fever when there's still no cure for this disease? Well, they learned which species of mosquito transmits it. They learned by careful experiments and control of which mosquito bit who. Uh, they actually managed at one point to have the same mosquito transmit two cases of yellow fever, biting a couple of people in a row. And they found out that an infected mosquito was only dangerous. It had to bite a sufferer during the sufferer's first three days of infection. Now, that meant that the sufferer didn't have symptoms yet. The, the mosquito that bit somebody with symptoms uh, probably was, was not going to transmit it. The mosquitoes were only dangerous if they bit a sufferer during the first three days of infection. Uh, well, that's not very useful. It means that the, the vector is invisible in a way. In another way, it is useful uh, because they know more about it. They came up with inoculations and inoculations began to be implemented and they were killing soldiers. Uh, the early inoculations that were being used uh, were as lethal as the disease. Uh, so inoculation was not the original answer. What had to be done was control of the mosquitoes. Uh, the potential sufferers now knew that mosquitoes were the danger. And eradicating this particular species of mosquito as much as possible was going to control yellow fever in the areas around camps, around ports. Uh, it turned out that that old Charleston superstition that the bad air from the swamp spread yellow fever, it wasn't the bad air from the swamp, it was the swamp mosquitoes riding on the air from the swamp who were transmitting the disease. 
And so control of those mosquitoes was the critical thing. And this is gonna be incredibly important just a couple of years later when the United States sets out on our big project to dig the Panama Canal. Because of Walter Reed, because of, of Levi Folk and his comrades, uh, because of what they learned, yellow fever today has been eliminated from some of the regions it used to haunt. Uh, it doesn't strike us in South Carolina anymore. Cuba is not on the World uh, Health Organization's yellow fever map as a danger zone at all anymore. It has been uh, eradicated from those areas. And people are going into areas where you can contract yellow fever. Those folks now have an effective vaccination. And uh, it's quite a process. Uh, what, what happens is they inject um, the disease into chicken eggs. And then the egg whites develop antibodies against the disease and it's antibodies from the egg whites uh, that are used as the vaccination and it's not one you have to catch up on like your tetanus shot you get vaccinated for yellow fever once uh, and that's good for a lifetime it's very effective protection but to this day there's still no cure for that once thought to be virulent filth disease well here we have a picture of some of the men coming home see the guy with a banjo here in front of the smokestack of the ship and somebody else with a souvenir Cuban hat that he's wearing instead of his issue campaign hat. Uh, some of the guys look like they're getting seasickness on the way home, I'm not sure. But South Carolinians are gonna return home, including our 10th immune troops. Uh, and they're gonna come home with a couple of successes under their belt, not only mission accomplished, but also uh, taking on the secondary and more dangerous foe of yellow fever. Now, Lieutenant J.S. Cochran of Abbeville, South Carolina, uh, doesn't have anything directly to do with the yellow fever story that I'm aware of. He's just one of the coolest images in our collection. And I do want to remind you that when this quarantine period is over, you can come in and see his sword right there and some other items from that period on display in the collection of the state's oldest and finest military museum, and that is the Confederate Reliquary in Columbia, South Carolina.